안녕하십니까 마스코스 온라인 오늘은 얼리 컴플리케이션 Hello, welcome to Master Course Online. I'm going to talk about early complication management. I am Jingu Kim from Yonsei 9 Dental Office. During the surgery, we encounter problems and also after surgery. One to seven days uh, after surgery, complications can occur and uh, they are called early complications and I'm going to talk about uh, some important uh, complications. First, the bleeding and swelling. Post-op, patients uh, sometimes come back with a swollen face on day two or three after surgery. And they are very concerned when they come to my office and they're swelling. And uh, they appear with a blood clot in the mouth after continuous bleeding. Ecchymosis and hematoma can be experienced as well. Rather than calling them complications, these are natural reaction of the patient after surgery. And we need to tell the patient in advance before surgery that this can happen, bleeding or bruise. If patients are warned of these problems, there will be no problem, but if not, patients would be very much concerned and rapport with the patient would be broken. First of all, why does bleeding happen? Bleeding is frightening as it can happen during surgery and a patient may appear bleeding the next day. The causes of bleeding, inflame the tissues, bleeding disorder, when artery is cut. First, inflamed tissues. If you look at here, this area is serious. Splinting of natural tooth and implant can be controversial, but serious bone loss occurred here. The palatal bone loss is quite serious. Pre-op, inflamed tissues were observed. A flap was opened. Inflamed tissues were removed, hardly any other tissues remain. So inflamed tissues cause swelling and discomfort and continuous bleeding. What are the causes? We need to think about inflamed tissues. The tissues are abundant with blood vessels and capillary widening, increased permeability. Blood components that are supposed to be in the blood vessel come out of the vessel. Plasma or proteins would be leaked out of the vessel, inevitably leading to swelling. Serious swelling and edema can be experienced by such patients. With increased permeability of blood vessels, proteins in the vessel will come out, leading to swelling and bleeding. And we need to explain this to the patient in advance. The second cause of bleeding is from bleeding disorder. Inherited bleeding disorders include von Willebrand's disease, hemophilia. Patients with the disorder should be screened before surgery. Next, acquired bleeding disorders. Patients with liver disease or on anticoagulant drug, platelet function regulating drug, can experience continuous bleeding after surgery. Bleeding is stopped through the primary aggregation and secondary coagulation. Intrinsic and extrinsic pathways can be involved. Platelet plays a role and the coagulation. Fibrin can play a different role. We need to understand that. There are many different types of bleeding disorders. First, non-thrombocytopenic purpura. It means purpura occurs when platelets are not deficient due to vascular wall alteration by infection and allergy and disorder of platelet function by taking aspirin and NSAIDs from Willebrand's disease as well. Thrombocytopenic purpura 
caused by infection, leukemia, or drugs. Acquired bleeding disorders, hemophilia, factor 8 or 9 deficiency, liver disease, and heparin, coumarin, aspirin. Bleeding occurs because of the drugs. Causes of bleeding tendency. Platelet count is very important. This is normal range under 40 to 400,000 in one cc. However, when it is below 80,000 platelet deficiency, if it is below 50,000, bleeding tendency would increase. So continuous bleeding may occur in such patients after surgery. Coagulation factor deficiency, factor 7, 9, 10, or vitamin K deficiency. Patients with liver disease, gallbladder disease have this kind of problem. Also those with gallbladder removed. We cannot check everything one by one. What can we do about it? First, PT. It is the ability to make clot. We need to evaluate it. A PTT is more important. It determines if blood thinning therapy is effective. It is an indicator. What is important is that blood clotting problem is very rare to see. If there is a blood clotting problem, bleeding will occur throughout surgery but mostly unstable blood clots due to blood clotting factors is the problem and they are caused by drugs and these are represented by numbers international normalized ratio INR in short there are patients who are on anticoagulation therapy to prevent blood coagulation general normal INR is 1 if it is between 2.5 and 3.0, we need to be careful. And if it is over 3, we should not perform operation on the patient. Patients who are on anticoagulation should maintain the INR between 2 and 3. Drugs cause blood disorders, anticoagulants, thrombolytics to dissolve blood clots for those whose blood vessels may be blocked by the clots or antiplatelets to reduce the function of platelets and clotting facilitants. These are related to continuous bleeding after surgery. The representative drug of this kind is heparin, which is easy to notice if it is used because it is injected to patients who are on dialysis. Heparin is absorbed and disappears quickly. The injection doesn't create really a problem, but we need to watch out for warfarin and NOA. Warfarin is for stent patient. It inhibits factors 2, 7, 9, and 10, destabilizing blood clots. It can cause copious bleeding. Warfarin should not be discontinued arbitrarily. You need to consult the matter with a medical doctor about the drug before surgery to regulate or control the drug. Next, NOAC, non-vitamin K antagonist oral anticoagulant for patients with ventricular fibrillation. The drug should be discontinued, but uh, they cannot afford to discontinue the use for a long time. You need to remember for NOAC drug names uh, frequently used in Korea. Zerato Lixiana Aliquis Pradaxa. This happened to my patient and it went down to the chest and up to the belly button. The patient was shocked to see the ecchymosis. Bleeding, swelling can occur after surgery and sometimes patients come back on the next day of surgery with the full of blood clots in the mouth. So you need to be careful in dealing with patients on NOAC. Next, Antiplatelet therapy. There are many drugs, including aspirin and dipiridamol. Five-day discontinuing is recommended. I don't always do that. In most cases, it's okay not discontinuing, but it should be dealt with case by case. Plavix, clopidogrel, 
doesn't need to be discontinued, but you need to consult with the internal medicine doctor. But all these drugs can cause continuous bleeding. Most NSAIs have a tendency of increasing bleeding. How to reduce swelling? To reduce bleeding, we need to be careful about the drugs that I talked about. To reduce swelling, there are some ways to do it. First, the gauze packing after surgery. For example, in the sinus surgery in the posterior region of maxilla, many layers of gauze can be put against the vestibule. It can apply compression against swelling. This can also prevent displacement of bone graft and applies compression so that swelling can be reduced reducing the space for swelling. Or you can use a pressure dressing. I use it often. If you expect this part to be swollen quite a lot due to long surgery time with lateral approach, you can put bend. You can use paper taping. The mandible is taped like this, but this is difficult for the patient to open the mouth, a discomfort. But this is for your reference to reduce swelling. The most dangerous bleeding as I said in my lectures, we don't really cause death or fatal injuries when dealing with other areas, but mandible lingual side is very dangerous. There's concavity, especially in the premolar area of mandible. There's a submandibular fossa and there's muscle in the area. There's uh, individual differences, but uh, there is severe concavity in some patients. So when we do drilling for placement, if we touch the lingual side, sublingual artery or submental artery runs in the area and they can be injured, which can cause severe bleeding. So if you just suture all of them together, uh, bleeding seems to be controlled. However, submental or sublingual artery can be damaged and um, the bleeding can cause the tongue to be lifted, so that can cause airway obstruction to the patient leading to death. This is very dangerous, so we need to be very careful about this, and we need to keep the lingual angulation in the premolar area of mandible. So you need to feel or take and observe the lingual side of premolar and molar areas on CT to carefully control the drilling path. Next, second, wound dehiscence and membrane exposure. Let's have a look at them. To avoid GBR failures, this is not a complete consensus report, but this appears in a journal, patient selection, defect type, blood supply, flap passivation, and membrane fixation. I want to introduce the paper. The major causes of wound dehiscence is inappropriate suture and remained tension in others. Minor wound dehiscence, if you wait, everything will be okay, especially when you use collagen membrane. The bone will be regenerated without a problem, so it is healed properly. However, however, in this case, two or three millimeters of opening was made after stitch out post of two weeks. But if you just wait, at three months and after the flap is raised, uh, no problem with the bone regeneration. What about a bigger opening? When you use a collagen membrane, it is uh, sometimes used expecting dehiscence and there's no problem, it is properly healed. So open technique is even used, so collagen membrane doesn't create problem. When minor exposure is made. The collagen membrane can contribute to the healing, but titanium mesh or non-resolvable membrane can create a problem. When the exposure is visible, you need to remove it immediately. In this patient, post up one week, the membrane was exposed and it was removed and replaced with a healing abutment and the site was healed without a problem. 
The patient did not come back for stitch out, and the problem was found post of three weeks. Bone graft below the titanium mesh was contaminated and infected, so nothing will work at this point, and implants need to be explanted. Let's look at my membrane exposure case. In this patient, extraction, implant placement, and GBR, and membrane was fixed and sutured. With the voluminous graft, the flap was very thin, and the patient was a smoker, and it was exposed, and bone graft was um, infected, contaminated, and inflamed, and the bone was not regenerated, so this is a failure case of bone grafting. If you look at here, soft tissue defect and the prosthetic shape is not good, so in conclusion, it was inevitable to have poor results. Another bone grafting is required here. Clinical outcomes of GBR, according to Chapasco's paper, exposure occurs in 5% of the resolvable membrane cases and 20% in non-resolvable membrane cases. And I agree with that. The non-resolvable membrane would have more exposures. Dr. Zitzman reported that there was no difference between smokers and non-smokers after GBR. But smoking patients show lower GBR success rate and the more clinicians accept that result. Next, nerve damages. After surgery, nerves are damaged often. We are always worried and concerned about lingual nerve, inferior alveolar nerve, and mental nerve, especially at number six and seven area in the mandible, during drilling, nerve canal can be damaged, causing neuroproxia and ultimately neurotimesis. How to respond to that can be different from case to case, and rather than that, we need to focus on how to avoid them. We tend to overlook the wide dimension of a drill. A drill has a pointed Y or V-shaped end at the bottom, which is the Y dimension. So the stopper has the length of one millimeter. If you drill up to the stopper and you intend to drill 10 millimeters in depth, but the depth would be different, different from what you intended. If the stopper reached the bone, you drill the 12 millimeters, including one millimeter at the bottom and one millimeter at the stopper. The Y dimension should be considered always, and the length is usually 0.8 to 1 millimeter. The Y dimension increases cutting efficiency, but you need to be aware of the length, otherwise you will drill longer than you intended, causing the problems. The Y dimension is a little bit different from drill to drill, and you need to consider the length in drilling. So, to reduce nerve damage, Considering the problem in the posterior region in the mandible, short and wide implants or vertical augmentation need to be considered. Ostem produces 5 to 6 millimeter implants. If you use a 6 millimeter implants in the limited vertical height, you can do the surgery and place the implant without damaging the nerve. When bone is lacking, GBR is done, and the top part of an implant can remain in soft tissue. In the maxilla, bone quality is poor, so I don't recommend the short implants. The implants need to be wide and not very wide. And uh, for rescue implants, especially when you replace existing implants, short implants can be considered nerve damage diagnosis. You need to mark the area where sensation is not proper. A two-point discrimination method is used for diagnosis, and there are many medications that can be used. 
Early response is very important. I usually use at the early stage drug tapering like this with steroid. Reducing pressure on the nerve is important when an implant is found to be pressing down on a nerve. The implant should be reversely rotated a little bit or removed. Many papers like this to reduce inflammation, NSAIDs or steroid or vitamin B complex can be used. If time passes by, the problem will get bigger, so at the beginning, if sensation gets dull when the nerve is not invaded, steroid treatment should be used. If it doesn't work, the patient should be immediately referred to specialists. Primary stability weakening. There are many cases where primary stability is lost, especially in the cases of immediate placement after extraction with a sinus graft. Often we get the stability from the apex 2 to 3 millimeters from the maxillary crystal bone and maxilla has poor bone quality so primary stability is low from there in such cases primary stability would be low but as you know primary stability is very important when primary stability is lacking micro motion or overloading occurs during healing period resulting in fiber integration in the interface between bone and implant surface, leading to failure of osseointegration, so we need to consider this fact. Critical threshold of micromotion usually is between 50 to 150 micrometer. If implant moves in that range, if the number is over the critical threshold, implant will have the possibility of fibro integration as I said before at the early stage there is no bone formation achieved so no stability from the new bone and the existing old bone is resorbed where stability would be lowered at about three weeks post-op stability deep would happen and uh, primary stability is the weakest and we are afraid to remove the healing abutment at this time and uh, within a month of implant placement primary stability is low it's between week two and four we need to be very careful in that period during the stability dip if the primary stability is not good for a patient, we need to consider submerging the implant rather than connecting a healing abutment. For better implant primary stability, these implants can be used. The TS4 compared to TS3 has bigger tapering and deeper threads, and wider implants can also obtain better primary stability. Tapered implants are helpful for primary stability. Primary stability is lost in the cases of sinus bone grafting and also GBR. Primary stability is very important to obtain it under drilling and tapered body implant should be used. I'm not sure about the length, the longer the better maybe, and implant diameter increase is helpful. Subcrestal positioning of an implant can create a problem. An implant can fall out, especially when residual bone is just one or two millimeters in the maxilla and if you try to place it deeper the implant stability can be lost rather than that in the upper posterior region which has thick gingiva like this when we place an ultra wide implant this part can remain in the soft tissue so this is a pretty good surgical option i believe I believe ultra-wide implant is very good at the top one millimeter. The bevel area, which is just etched without craters of SLA treatment, which breaks aluminum oxide, followed by etching. So the bevel area is just etched. 
the RA value is low and uh, there is a low possibility of other problems. So selectively, the open thread can remain in the soft tissue at the bottom of soft tissue. So the depth of the open thread can be adjusted depending on a situation. Low RA value in the bevel area. In the limited bone height in the maxillary sinus, an implant can be placed with the bevel area in the soft tissue that helps with obtaining primary stability. This concludes my lecture on early complications after surgery. More details will be provided in the offline class. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.